Good morning. Uh, it is a great, great pleasure to have the privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. William Kalin today. Uh, as you know, Dr. Kalin is the Sidney Farber Professor of uh, Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is also a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. He is the distinguished recipient of the Lasker Award in 2016, and then also the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2019. And we are absolutely thrilled to have him joining us today for the IKCS keynote for 2020. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kalin. It's a great pleasure to, to be with you today. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with you, at least virtually. Uh, and it's a great honor to give this talk. Uh, so here's my uh, disclosure slide. The most relevant one for today is my uh, involvement with a biotech company called Peloton that was recently acquired by Merck, uh, who's developing uh, HIP2 inhibitors. Uh, here are the people who've worked on von Hippolindau disease. Over the years in my laboratory, they're the true heroes of this story, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, here's a, just a partial list of our uh, collaborators who have made our work uh, possible, so we thank them. So my hypothesis is that some of the late mutations that occur during cancer evolution, whether they're driver mutations or passenger mutations, are only t tolerated, let alone advantageous, because of the mutations that preceded them. And so if you accept that hypothesis, we should be really focusing on targeting the early mutations, the so-called truncal mutations in cancer, because if true, if we could correct the early mutations uh, pharmacologically or genetically, that should selectively kill tumor cells. And, and I would argue that when we have been successful in precision oncology, it is because we're targeting uh, truncal mutations. Uh, that is to say the initiating mutations, some examples of which are shown here, but for today's talk, of course, I'm gonna focus on the role of uh, VHL and hence HIF and VEGF in kidney cancer. So how do we know that loss of VHL is the initiating or truncal event in clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which of course is the most common form of kidney cancer? Well, one experiment of nature is von Hippel-Lindau disease. These are patients who've inherited a defective version of the VHL gene from mom or dad, so they're effectively VHL heterozygotes. Uh, at birth, but th they're initially okay because there's no evidence for so-called haploinsufficiency for the VHL gene. As long as you have one wild type allele, you're okay. But then over time, these patients can develop numerous, in fact, hundreds of pre-neoplastic renal cysts, and when examined, the cells lining those cyst cavities are VHL null, so apparently loss of VHL in the human kidney causes pre-neoplastic renal cysts. And then over years to decades, some of these uh, lesions can progress to clear cell renal cell carcinomas, and when examined, those tumors have additional mutations involving other genes, presumably reflecting cooperating events. And these are fairly stereotypical uh, mutations involving now uh, specific genes that we've come to understand over the past decade, such as PBRM1 or BAP1. So we can conclude from this, first of all, that inactivation of VHL is not sufficient for renal carcinogenesis, even if it's a critical initiating event. But at least in this context, it is the initiating event. But of course, here the deck was rigged because there was a germline VHL mutation. What about in sporadic kidney cancers? Well, here the work of Charlie Swanton is very helpful. So what he and his team have done is to do spatially distinct biopsies of kidney tumors, including when possible of metastatic deposits. They've then done deep sequencing of those biopsies and have used mutant allele frequencies to infer the evolutionary histories of those tumors. And almost invariably, they see that inactivation of the VHL gene, biallelic inactivation of the VHL gene, is the initiating or truncal event. And then again, you see these stereotypical mutations that occur late, but they often occur in a subclonal or branching pattern. And so that's given rise to the idea of uh, truncal mutations versus branch mutations. And so I would argue both to deal with intratumoral heterogeneity and also to exploit these gene-gene interactions I talked about a moment ago, where some of these late mutations are only tolerated because of the early mutations, we should be targeting uh, VHL. Now, over the course of time, we learned that the VHL protein is part of the ubiquitin ligase complex, that in the presence of oxygen binds directly to the alpha subunit of the HIP transcription factor and targets it for proteasomal degradation, whereas when oxygen levels are low or the VHL protein has been mutated, now a HIP alpha can accumulate and can dimerize with this partner protein, aren't, and activate various and sundry HIF uh, target genes. 
So by the time you're a clear cell renal cell carcinoma, does, does, does VHL still matter? Uh, or is the horse out of the barn? And so uh, years ago, Othan Eliopoulos took VHL null renal cell carcinoma cell lines, and he restored the function of the VHL protein by stable transfection, or, although later we did it with retroviruses. And what he found was those cells could still grow on a plastic dish, but they lost the ability to form tumors. And then to address specifically the role of HIF, Keiichi Kondo took those cells and introduced into them a form of HIF-alpha, and particularly HIF-2-alpha, that can't be recognized by the BHL protein because of specific point mutations. And those cells regain the ability to form tumors. Conversely, when he took BHL null cells and eliminated HIF-2-alpha using short hairpin RNA technology, or we later did it with CRISPR, uh, those cells lose the ability to form tumors. And I should point out that this is a specific property of HIF-2-alpha and not the better studied canonical member of the family HIF-1-alpha. Uh, and so uh, to summarize, we think HIF2-alpha is the driver or oncoprotein in VHL null renal cell carcinoma cells. Uh, and if anything, HIF1-alpha seems to act as a tumor suppressor and is frequently uh, lost in such tumors. And I can see we're going to have some formatting issues. Now, HIF is a master regulator of hundreds of genes that promote adaptation to uh, a low oxygen environment, perhaps the best studied of which is VEGF. And by the 90s, a number of companies were developing VEGF inhibitors, and we argued if they were going to work in any solid tumor, they would work in kidney cancer. Uh, and I think you know we're now up to about seven uh, FDA-approved VEGF inhibitors for the treatment of kidney cancer, so that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is some patients don't respond to these agents, and even those patients who do respond will eventually progress. So how can we do better? Well, I think you would argue, just based on first principles, that rather than targeting VEGF, we should target HIF itself, and based on what I just told you, we should specifically target the HIF2-alpha paralog. Now, the conventional wisdom was that HIF wasn't druggable, but fortunately, uh, Rick Bruick and Kevin Gardner, who were then at UT Southwestern, ignored that dogma. They identified a potentially druggable pocket in the so-called HIF2-alpha past B domain, which I show you on the left. They then did uh, screens and identified chemicals, chemicals that could bind to this pocket, and in so doing, induce an allosteric change such that if 2 alpha could no longer bind to ARNT, and hence could no longer bind to DNA. And these chemicals were then outlicensed to Peloton Therapeutics, who did traditional medicinal chemistry to make these more drug-like. They improved their potency, their specificity, and their bioavailability. <clears throat> and they were kind enough to provide us with a tool compound called PT2399 that was one or two atoms different from what was then their lead compound. And Chin Cho in the lab showed that in preclinical models of VHL null, Kidney cancer, uh, this compound did what you would like. It decreased HIF-dependent mRNAs. It decreased proliferation and soft agar growth, and it decreased tumor growth in uh, nude mice uh, xenograft assays. Uh, but these are all down assays, decrease, decrease, and decrease. And so you would worry whether these effects were really on target or off target. So just to show you a typical experiment, here are soft agar assays with a VHL null renal carcinoma cell line. Uh, and the cells were treated with 0.2 or 2 micromolar of the HIF2-alpha inhibitor. And you can see a profound decrease in soft agar growth. Uh, and that's exciting, but I could, I've done this with Clorox bleach or with uh, formalin if I adjusted the concentrations properly. But to show this was on target, we took advantage of a point mutant of HIF2-alpha that had been identified by Rick Bruick and Kevin Gardner. This mutation in HIF2-alpha prevents the binding of the drug to HIF2-alpha but otherwise leaves, leaves HIF2-alpha uh, intact. And so that allowed Chin to do the following experiment. So she used CRISPR to generate isogenic renal carcinoma cell lines, which in the top panels had wild-type HIF2-alpha, or in the lower panels had this drug-resistant HIF2-alpha. And you could see that the drug-resistant version uh, basically allowed these cells to continue to form soft agar colonies. And so this said that this effect was on target. In the interest of time, I'll tell you, we saw that the, uh, in orthotopic tumor assays, likewise, the cells with the drug-resistant HIF2-alpha could now still form tumors despite the drug. So the anti-tumor effects were on target as well. Uh, now, we tested a number of renal carcinoma cell lines, and much to our surprise, uh, some of them were sensitive to the HIF2 inhibitor and some were not. And when tested, the insensitive cells could even tolerate genetic ablation of HIF2-alpha. And you can actually see this here in data from the Broad Institute depth map collection. So, uh, for those of you who are not used to looking at these data, what I'm showing you here is either uh, in, enrichment above or depletion below the horizontal line of uh, guides, CRISPR guides against HIF2-alpha 
in various uh, cell lines. Each dot is a different cell line, and the lineages are shown along the x-axis. So uh, the blue dots are the kidney cancer cell lines in the collection. And you can see that uh, in many of the cell lines, uh, HIF2 alpha depletes are HIF2 alpha guides are depleted over time, consistent with these cell lines being HIF2 alpha dependent. But frankly, uh, some of the cell lines did not deplete the HIF2 alpha guides over time as though they were HIF2 alpha independent. Now, this foreshadowed heterogeneity that was seen in the clinic when the current version of the HIF2 alpha inhibitor was tested in phase two trials in patients with advanced kidney cancer. So these are so-called swimmer's plots. As you probably know, each horizontal line is a patient uh, and how long they stayed on trial at the time of this analysis. The patients with the black uh, arrows were continuing to do well on therapy at the time of this analysis. The patients with the yellow stars had achieved a partial response by resist criteria. Uh, I should point out that these were heavily pretreated patients. Over 90% had failed a VEGF inhibitor, and over 70% had failed a checkpoint uh, inhibitor. So this looks like glass half full, glass half empty, that some of the patients seem to be benefiting. And based on these data, the drug has gone into phase three trials in patients with advanced kidney cancer. Uh, but some patients clearly were not responding, and so we have to think about what we can do for those patients. <clears throat> now, in point of fact, again, we had this heterogeneity uh, clue or, or or indication early on in our preclinical pre studies. I've already showed you that some of the cell lines were HIF2 dependent and some of the cell lines were HIF2 independent. And maybe these HIF2 independent lines are models for the patients who didn't uh, respond. Now, I do have to do a little bit of a mea culpa here because we did suggest that maybe one of the determinants of sensitivity was the integrity of the P53 pathway because based on a very limited number of cell lines, it looked like uh, you needed an intact P53 pathway in order to be HIF2 alpha dependent. But Laura Stransky has now examined more of cell lines, and that correlation is broken down. So, for example, here what I'm showing you is we're treating the cells with or without a topoci, which is a DNA damaging agent, and we're looking at the adduction of P53 as well as its targets, such as P21. So you can see that, for example, on the left, 7860 cells, they have an intact P53 pathway because they induce P53 and P21 in response to DNA damage. Uh, TUHR42KB cells, however, are HIF2 dependent, but they don't induce P53. So in fact, it doesn't look like you need to be able to induce P53. Conversely, khaki 2 cells do induce P53, but they're not HIF2 dependent. So the correlation is broken down. Just to drum this home further, Laura Stransky in the lab has taken a sensitive cell line, OSRC2, and in the lower left, I'm showing you that she's completely eliminated P53 using CRISPR. And yet, if you look at the soft agar colony plates in the upper left, uh, you can see these cells are still inhibited by PT2399. So we no longer think P53 status is a biomarker for uh, HIF2 alpha dependence. <clears throat> so what can we do about these patients who didn't respond? Well, I've had a longstanding interest in synthetic lethality. You may know that two genes are synthetic lethal mutations in either gene alone are compatible with viability, but where mutations in both genes simultaneously leads to cell death. And it was Hartwell and Friend many years ago who suggested we should be using this concept more in cancer. And in particular, if the A gene was your favorite cancer gene, such as the VHL gene and kidney cancer, we should find all the synthetic lethal interactors and we should drug them because at least in principle, the inhibitor of the B gene should selectively or preferentially kill the cells that have the sensitizing mutation, the, the mutation in the cancer-relevant gene. So uh, how do you get there? Well, there are a number of ways you can get the possible synthetic lethals. So uh, a number of years ago, uh, George Vanderwood uh, and Rick Klausner published that VHL null renal carcinoma cells are hypersensitive to the MET ligand HGF. And back in the days of the dinosaur, and I should also point out there's evidence for crosstalk between HIF and MET. And, and back in the days of the dinosaurs, uh, we uh, did an experiment where we took VHL null renal carcinoma cells or isogenic cells where we had restored the function of the VHL gene. And we treated them with uh, short hairpin RNAs against various genes, including the one shown on the left. Uh, and at least in these assays, it looked like VHL null cells were more sensitive to MET depletion than their VHL restored uh, counterparts. Uh, and that provided part of the motivation 
for Tony Shuri to test cabozantinib, which is a dual VEGF med inhibitor for the treatment of kidney cancer, which as shown here, I think, in the registration trial, was superior to Everolimus. So this is consistent with MET playing a role in clear cell renal cell carcinoma, but I must say, scientifically, this is a bit unsatisfying because it, it could be the case that cabozantinib is simply a better uh, VEGF inhibitor than the VEGF inhibitors that these patients had failed uh, previously. So I would say this is consistent with, but does not prove, a role of MET in clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Now, another way to get to synthetic lethals is to do high-throughput screens, and a lot of people have been doing screens with hairpin libraries and more recently with CRISPR guide libraries. So the way we like to do these is to take VHL null tumor cells expressing Cas9, so they'll support CRISPR gene editing. Uh, and what Hillary Nicholson did was she introduced a dox-inducible VHL, so she could infect the cells under the cover of doxocycline, so they would be VHL proficient. And then after editing occurred, she either continued the docs or removed the docs and then looked for CRISPR guides that were depleted in the docs null cells, that is to say the cells that were now no longer expressing BHL. And whenever possible, we like to complement these screens with arrayed chemical screens using isogenic cells, BHL proficient, BHL defective, using annotated chemical compound libraries. And we also like to do RNAi screens in Drosophila cells using isogenic fly cells that are either VHL wild type or VHL uh, null. Now, another version of this screen uh, is shown here, where Hillary, instead of inducing VHL with doxycycline, she treated the cells with a HIF2-alpha inhibitor and then either continued the HIF2-alpha inhibitor or removed the HIF2-alpha inhibitor. Now, of course, VHL does many things in addition to regulating HIF2-alpha, but HIF2-alpha is certainly one of the major things it does. Now, one of the true positives from this screen appeared to be CDK4 and its uh, cousin CDK6. The Drosophila uh, ancestral gene scored in the RNAi screen. Uh, and human isogenic screen, some of the CDK4-6 inhibitors scored. Uh, it scored in her human CRISPR screen using the doxinducible VHL, but only if she looked at cyclin B1, which is, again, one of the partner proteins for CDK4 and 6. And interestingly, the synthetic lethality appears to be HIF independent. So this just shows you what a validation experiment might look like. She took uh, 7860 cells, which again are VHL null, and then she reintroduced VHL along with a red fluorescent protein, or she only introduced a green fluorescent protein and, and the cells otherwise remained VHL defective. She mixed them one to one and then treated them with CDK4-6 inhibitors. Here I'm showing you the data with the bemocyclid. And you can see over time a nice outgrowth of the VHL proficient cells at the expense of the VHL defective cells. Uh, now, these drugs also seem active uh, in, in orthotopic tumor assays. So on the left, I'm showing you Kaplan-Meier data uh, from mice bearing orthotopic tumors formed by a HIF2-dependent renal carcinoma cell line. On the right is a, a similar analysis, but now the cell line is HIF2-independent. But I will remind you that the synthetic lethality is not HIF2-driven. Uh, and here, Hillary treated the animals by or garbage for 28 days with the CDK4-6 inhibitor palbocyclib. Uh, and despite only being treated for 28 days, you see a nice prolongation uh, in survival. Now, I mentioned that uh, this synthetic lethality is HIF2 independent. So in principle, you should be able to combine the drugs. And that was done on the left. So here, we're, we're again doing those competition assays where we're looking at the ratio of the VHL proficient cells to the VHL defective cells. So in the black bar are the data I showed you a moment ago, where if you add uh, a, a increasing amounts of palbocyclib, you, you see an increase in the ratio of the VHL proficient cells. But you see an even more dramatic effect if you add the HIF2 inhibitor. So that's in the two cell lines on the left that are HIF2 uh, dependent. Uh, on the right are the two HIF2 independent cell lines. So here again, you see the effect of the CDK4-6 inhibitor in the black bars, but there's no further benefit of combining the HIF2 inhibitor. So at best, you would see additive, and maybe if you were lucky, synergistic effects if you were treating a HIF2-dependent tumor. Uh, and at right, at least there's no evidence for antagonism between these drugs. Now, we started to model this combination in, in vivo. Uh, it's early days, but there's a strong hint that if you do orthotopic tumor assays here using my, uh, uh, tumors that are expressing luciferase so we can non-invasively monitor the tumors, and there's a suggestion that if you can combine the two drugs, that that might be uh, more efficacious than either drug alone. Uh, and in the Kaplan-Meier curve in the lower right, in the blue are the animals that got the combination. And, and some of those animals were actually tumor-free. 
at necropsy. So uh, based in part on these preclinical data, a clinical trial is planned of a CDP4-6 inhibitor in advanced kidney cancer. Now, why might you get these additive or synergistic effects? Well, first of all, I did tell you that the synthetic lethality is not HIF2 driven, and we're trying to understand the mechanism of the synthetic lethality. But at least in those cell lines that are HIF2 dependent, we know that HIF2 alpha drives the expression of cyclin D1. You can actually see that in the lower Western blots where the cells were or were not treated with PT2399, again, the HIF2 inhibitor. The two red cell lines are HIF2 dependent, and you see down regulation of cyclin D1 whereas UMRC2 and 769P are HIF2 independent, and there's no effect on cyclin D1. So I think we might learn something from our friends uh, in the world of breast cancer because they've already learned that in breast cancer, combining tamoxifen with a CDK or, or an ER antagonist with a CDK4-6 inhibitor is a good thing to do, and maybe that's because when you add an ER antagonist, you lower cyclin D1 transcription, uh, and cyclin D1 is then the partner for CDK4-6 which you're now going to inhibit with a small molecule. So maybe we can do something analogous in kidney cancer by combining PT2399 with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, at least for those tumors that are still HIF2 dependent. Now, I should also point out there have been a number of papers, this is a partial list, that have suggested that CDK4-6 inhibitors might enhance cancer immunotherapy. So maybe these drugs would be even more active in immunocompetent mice and would be even more active and people. And here I have to do another mea culpa because this is how I felt about cancer immunotherapy for many years because for decades it had overpromised and under delivered and I had promised myself I wouldn't be Charlie Brown here anymore and try to kick the football. But uh, data are data and finally the data started coming in that immune therapy actually could work. Here of course are early data on the treatment of melanoma with an anti CTLA4 antibody called it Lumamag. And uh, the two upper bars here are the patients who got epilubumab, and you can see a modest but real improvement in overall survival, but perhaps more importantly, you begin to see the suggestion of a tail, as though there are long-term survivors. Now, uh, if you were cynic, you could say, but wait a minute, we've known melanoma is a immunogenic tumor for many years. Tell me about non-immunogenic tumors. But of course, you may know that checkpoint inhibitors now also have worked for a variety of tumors we didn't think of as being immunogenic, such as non-small cell lung cancer. So here are so-called spider plots, where each line is an individual patient, and we're monitoring uh, their change in tumor burden. Uh, and you can see that a number of patients treated with the anti-PD-1 antibody nivolumab uh, benefited in this clinical trial. And this audience probably knows very well that immune checkpoint inhibitors also have a role, it would seem, in kidney cancer. So here are data from what I think might have been the registration trial for nivolumab in advanced kidney cancer compared to uh, ever almost the standard of care. So why might kidney cancer be so immunogenic? So this is a famous slide that some of you might have seen. On the y-axis, it's showing you the som somatic mutational burden, and the x-axis is showing various tumor types. So on the far right is melanoma. Melanomas have a very high mutational burden, including lots of UV-induced mutations, and so people have wondered whether that was one of the reasons why it's highly immunogenic. But here's kidney cancer in the middle. You know, why is kidney cancer conspicuously immunogenic? It's certainly far more immunogenic than some of the tumors on the right, uh, such as esophageal adenocarcinoma or glioblastoma. Well, one suggestion I think comes from Richard Childs and coworkers at the NCI. They had been treating patients with metastatic uh, kidney cancer with allogeneic stem cell transplants, and some patients did respond, including some patients had complete responses. And they had identified in one patient who had a complete response, CD8-positive T cells that recognized a tenmer peptide derived from a uh, translated human endogenous retrovirus, HERVE. And they noted that HERVE is expressed in renal, cell, renal cell carcinoma, but not, is not detectable in normal tissues or other cancers. Uh, now, this idea has been picked up by others, and I apologize to the authors who have been destroyed here with some sort of, again, uh, platform problem. But in any event, uh, multiple groups, including the top paper is from Kim Rathmel uh, and Sridhar Arganesan, and the bottom paper is from Ben uh, Benson. Uh, and they have found that there seems to be a correlation between endogenous retrovirus expression and the probability of responding to immune checkpoint blockade in clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Uh, 
Now, in the case of Richard Childs, they had actually shown that this HERVE was actually seemingly directly controlled by HIF2. And I've already told you today that HIF2 is negatively regulated by the VHL protein, which, of course, is crippled in most clear cell renal cell carcinomas. So this provided a very nice, satisfying explanation for why HERVE might be overexpressed in kidney cancer. Uh, but Chichen Jiang in my laboratory has now found that multiple ERBs behave in just the same way, uh, that there are multiple ERBs that are upregulated in clear cell renal cell carcinomas because of deregulation of HIP2. And we're currently trying to find out uh, which of those, if any, are translated, as is the case of HERBE. Uh, now, uh, to test immunotherapies in kidney cancer, it would be nice to have uh, immunocompetent mouse models of VHL null clear cell renal cell carcinoma that are robust and uh, make predictions that turn out to be true. Uh, we've really lacked uh, such uh, models up to now. Uh, and so to try to address this, uh, Laura Stransky in the lab obtained from Feng Zhang at MIT a mouse that expresses Cas9, so it will support CRISPR-based gene editing, but only after a so-called lock-stop locks cassette has been edited with pre recombinants And modeled on Feng's work and Tyler Jack's work and others, uh, what uh, she has done together with Wenwa Gao in my lab and Laura Schmidt is to make adeno-associated viruses that will express CRE, so again, loop out that lock stop locks cassette, but will also encode various CRISPR guides against uh, bona fide or suspected kidney cancer tumor suppressors, such as VHL, PBRM1, and TSC1. So what they've done is to directly inject these viruses into the kidneys of those lock stop locks Cas9 mice. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, we are seeing kidney tumors arising uh, in these mice that have at least some of the features of human clear cell uh, renal cell carcinoma. Although in the interest of full disclosure, I will tell you we have not confirmed to our satisfaction that these tumors are HIP2 uh, dependent. Now, I think we're going to probably need to combine eventually three or four active drugs to cure uh, kidney cancer. Uh, why, why do I say that? Well, this is a fa fairly famous picture in clinical oncology. You may know that this is a picture of a patient who had metastatic melanoma, uh, whose melanoma had an activating mutation in BRAF. Uh, here on the left, you can see these multiple subcutaneous nodules. The patient was then treated with the BRAF inhibitor from Plexicon and had this Lazarus-like remission, but then within months, they were right back in hot water. Uh, and this has led some to question whether we're really on the right path when it comes to targeted agents and precision oncology. So here's a perspective by uh, Jim Watson, where he says, given the seemingly almost intrinsic genetic instability of many late-stage cancers, we should not be surprised when key old timers in cancer genetics doubt being able to truly cure most victims of widespread metastatic uh, cancer. So hardly an uplifting uh, view, point of view. But you know, this is really a math problem, and so I think we have to rediscover uh, classical pharmacological principles that I learned at the knee of people like Tom Fry back in the 80s. So a typical cubic centimeter tumor might have 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th cells. The tumor burden in most cancer patients is 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 12th cells. So even if you have a great drug like that Plexicon B RAF inhibitor, but one in a million cells are resistant, either epigenetically or genetically, to the, to the drug, then your chance of cure with a single agent is approximately zero. Uh, but th the way to make the math work is to combine drugs that, have, that are not cross-resistant to one another, uh, that have distinct mechanisms of action. As I say, they're independent. Uh, and, because, and we hope because they have distinct mechanisms of action, their toxicities won't overlap in a prohibitive way, so they can be given an efficacious dose. And again, the idea here is that they're non-cross-resistant. Now the math works for you, because at least in a perfect view, if you combine three drugs where the probability of being resistant to any one drug was one in a million, then the chance of being resistant to all three now becomes one in 10 to the minus 18. And so now the math works for you. Uh, and frankly, this has been, again, rediscovered very nicely in an Eli paper by uh, Peter Sorga at Adam Palmer, where they went back and using preclinical models and mathematical models, were able to basically confirm that RCHOP, as old fashioned as it is, uh, works precisely because it exploits these principles, that there's minimal cross-resistance across the drugs in the cocktail. 
So I think, uh, you know, maybe we're at a point where you can start to see what some of those combinations would look like. Uh, here are data I think were presented by, at ESMO by my colleague Tony Shurari, combining a checkpoint inhibitor with cabozantinib in the light blue uh, or aqua. Uh, and you can see this appeared to be better than the standard of care agent, which was uh, sunitinib. Uh, I think you can start to dream what an eventual kidney cancer curative combination might look like. Uh, it, I suspect it will contain a VEGF inhibitor, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, maybe a HIP2 inhibitor, maybe a CDK4-6 inhibitor, maybe even a MET inhibitor. Uh, I should point out that, the, for example, the VEGF inhibitor that we want in the cocktail may or may not be the VEGF inhibitor with the highest single agent activity. Uh, because to build these combinations, the drugs are going to have to be sufficiently specific that they can be combined with other drugs. And so in the era of single agent therapy, you don't get penalized. And sometimes you actually get rewarded if you have lots of off-target effects, because sometimes those off-target effects can seemingly uh, contribute to efficacy. Uh, but they may prohibit whether, you know, they may prohibit actually ever taking that drug into a meaningful uh, combination. Uh, I have in mind drugs like sunitinib, uh, which are pleiotropic and multi-targeted uh, at best. So in closing, I already showed you the swimmer's plot uh, of the HIP2 inhibitor being developed by now Merck. I told you this drug's going into phase three trials. But I also told you that a lot of the patients in the lower left here didn't seem to benefit. But again, as is typical of phase two trials, these patients were heavily pretreated. They had failed VEGF inhibitors. They almost, almost always failed a check an inhibitor. Uh, and you might have wondered, how would this drug have fared in an earlier line of therapy in patients who hadn't been so heavily pretreated, maybe didn't have such a large uh, tumor burden? And so fortunately, we were able to convince uh, Peloton to test this uh, drug before they were acquired by Merck uh, in patients with VHL disease who had measurable kidney tumors that had not, not been treated medically before. These were patients in careful surveillance programs uh, who were in careful surveillance programs in an attempt to prevent or delay the need for repeated uh, surgeries. So to be on the trial, you had to have at least one measurable kidney tumor, but you could also have other measurable tumors such as hemangioblastomas of the brain or eye or uh, pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, these data were presented by Eric Yonash and colleagues at ASCO this summer. Uh, gratifyingly, 87% of them had some tumor shrinkage. 40% uh, had either a confirmed PR or a PR that's awaiting independent confirmation. The median progress progression-free survival has not been reached. And the 12-month progression-free survival is 98.3%. Uh, and as you would have hoped, in addition to seeing responses in the kidney, it looks like some of the other VHL-associated neoplasms, such as the hemangioblastomas, and the pancreatic lesions can also respond. So this is what the uh, swimmer spot looks like now. Uh, you can again see uh, for orientation this dashed vertical line, uh, which is one year on therapy. Once again, the, uh, the black arrows are patients who were still on therapy doing well at the time of this analysis. And the uh, yellow bars are the confirmed partial responses and the orange bars are partial responses that are awaiting uh, independent confirmation. Uh, I should point out this drug is very well tolerated. Uh, it has as an on-target toxicity anemia, uh, which is manageable with erythropoietin. Uh, uh, perhaps somewhat more concerning toxicity is hypoxemia, which is usually, thankfully, asymptomatic. Uh, that probably relates to uh, the role of HIP2-alpha in the pulmonary vasculature, as well as in the carotid uh, body that controls uh, ventilation. So these are statistics. Statistics can be rather dry, uh, but I think to try to give this a human face or almost a human face, uh, I'm going to share with you two things. Uh, even before the data were presented, if you were as smart as my children at social media, you could see that some of the patients on the trial were responding because they were posting such on their uh, social media sites. Uh, now, I might point out these patients have been living with the sword of Damocles over their neck, uh, and they've watched this disease ravage their families generation after generation. So it's been extremely moving to see some of these posts where patients are writing things like, I never thought I'd see this day, and they're describing how some of their tumors are getting smaller or disappearing altogether. And in closing, I'm going to share a video with you, if we can. The wonders of modern technology. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hey everybody, it's Justin, and I just wanted to give you a quick update. I am in a gondola right now in uh, Taiwan. Over there is Taipei 101. Uh, the gondola is actually right by the Taipei Zoo. But I just wanted to give you a quick update and uh, say I'm doing well. I'm enjoying my trip. If it wasn't for the PT2977 drug trial, I would have never been able to come out here and do what I'm doing right now. Um, so I just want to thank Peloton and I hope Merck will fast track this drug for a VHL treatment. Um, so if you guys are listening, hopefully you guys will put it on the market to help VHL. But uh, yeah, keep uh, watching these videos. I'll be making more and I'll, I'll get better at it and I have to get the angles right because I kind of look fat, you know? <laughs> Anyways, I'll show you some of the views um, and then you guys uh, make sure to subscribe to my blog. So. At that age, uh, you should be more concerned about whether you look fat on your video than, for example, worried about what your next CAT scan uh, is going to look like. Uh, so with that, I will thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. So, Dr. Kalen, thank you so much uh, for your, a great talk and all of your insights. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, uh, there's a Q&A box in the bottom left-hand side of your screen uh, where you can type in Kate questions for Dr. Kalen. Uh, so Dr. Kalen, I had a quick question for you in terms of um, thinking about the HIF2 inhibitor independence. Do you think that this is from other proteins that are targeted by VHL, or do you think it's a downstream event of HIF2? Yeah, that's a great question. We have found that some of the cell lines that are insensitive to HIF2 loss are also insensitive to restoration of VHL function. So we more so we're not thinking as much about other VHL targets as some additional mutations or perhaps epigenetic changes that now render VHL irrelevant. Uh, frankly, when I saw the initial swimmers plots in the advanced setting, I was worried that, gee, maybe 30, 40% of kidney cancer is gonna just have followed a different molecular evolution and maybe never was HIF2 dependent. But the, that's why I think the VHL patient experience is so encouraging. That it suggests to me that at least in that setting, at least early on, you are HIF2 alpha dependent. Now, maybe with multiple lines of therapy and we beat up the patients enough, we finally select for clones that are insensitive to HIF2 loss. But that, that's my hope, that if we can move these drugs earlier, that maybe we'll see an even higher percentage of patients will still be sensitive to the HIF2 inhibitors. But we are actively trying to understand that resistance. <laughs> and so a uh, question from the audience, um, you know, given the fact that we do use a lot of vegetative targeted therapies for the non-clear cell space, uh, what do you think are the, the, is going to be the activity of the HIF2 inhibitor uh, for non-clear cell RCC? Yeah, a great question. So l let me first, uh, and, 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 I, and I think this is important for the, maybe the younger people on the call to have this perspective. You know, when I started out in the 90s working on kidney cancer, you know, kidney cancer was a bit of a backwater, as you probably know, in molecular oncology. And if you weren't fond of a young faculty member, you told them to go work on kidney cancer because uh, nothing worked. Uh, or put another way, everything worked at about a 5% level, but that, in hindsight, was almost always spontaneous <laughs> regressions, which were well described in kidney cancer. And so... It's, it's, it's very uh, sobering to think there was a time not too long ago where you could justify having a placebo arm in a clinical trial of patients with metastatic kidney cancer. So now, as you indicate, or the question indicates, we have multiple VEGF inhibitors. Uh, and it is true that VEGF inhibitors sometimes play a role in other uh, solid tumors or the management of other solid tumors. But if you, if you look at VEGF expression across solid tumors, VEGF expression is much, much higher in kidney cancer than it is in other solid tumors. And that's almost certainly because the minute you lose VHL, you upregulate HIF and VEGF. And so there's very little selection pressure to turn on alternative angiogenic pathways, where as in other solid tumors, 
it's probably a, a bit of a chicken soup of different angiogenic factors that are being exploited. So I think that A explains why VEGF inhibitors are more consistently useful in kidney cancer than they are in other solid tumors, even if, if there's a measurable effect in other solid tumors. Now, the other part of the question is HIF2 inhibitors. Are, are HIF2 inhibitors going to be important in other solid tumors? There, I, I suspect the answer is mostly going to be no, because most solid tumors don't even express HIF2 alpha. Most tumors only express HIF1 alpha. So the only way I will be wrong, and I've been wrong many times before, is if HIF2 alpha also turns out to play roles in the immune system or in the host response that turn out to be useful therapeutically, but we're not smart enough to say that uh, yet. So I think other than the tumors seen in VHL disease, such as kidney cancer, paragangioma, and angioblastomas, I can't point to another tumor where I'm confident HIF2 inhibitors play a role. And then finally, I'm sometimes asked, does it make any sense to combine a HIF2 inhibitor with a VEGF inhibitor? And there, I think the answer is a resounding yes, because not all the VEGF in a kidney tumor is coming from the kidney cancer cells themselves. Some of it's coming from the compressed host cells, the stromal cells, and they're often using HIF-1. So I think there is a rationale for combining a HIF-2 inhibitor with a VEGF inhibitor. And following up on that, in terms of for rationales for combinations, like... Uh, you showed that the uh, HRVs were downstream of the HIF2, yep. of HIF2 and uh, would that have an inhibitory effect in terms of trying to combine? Yeah, yeah. Like... yeah. Great, great question. It's one we think about almost every day. Uh, you know, one of my colleagues says, if you're smart enough, you can always think of a reason why something will fail. And my corollary is, if you can't think of a reason why something will fail, you don't know what you're doing. So I think you're absolutely right. If based on first principles, you might say, well, wait a minute, Bill, if you combine a HIF2 inhibitor with a checkpoint inhibitor, you're going to downregulate the ERVs and you're going to get less bang for the buck from your checkpoint inhibitor. But that makes many, many, many assumptions, uh, some of which may turn out not to be right. So, for example, that assumes that almost every cell in the tumor has sort of a homogeneous response to the two agents. But the other ways you get benefits from combination therapy is you might imagine there's a subpopulation of cells <clears throat> that would respond to a HIF2 inhibitor, but frankly, nothing would, they, they were never going to respond to a checkpoint inhibitor, and, and vice versa. There might be cells that will, would have always responded to a checkpoint inhibitor, but never would have treated, responded to a HIF2 inhibitor. So I think we have to be a little bit Catholic about this and <clears throat> just do the clinical experiment. And I can also imagine that sequencing might be very important here also, depending on the kinetics with which you, for example, downregulate the ERVs. And I think finally, I think there are still things we're learning about other things HIF2 does with respect to the immune response that might be as important and maybe even more important than the ERV modulation. Uh, another question from the audience. Um, you know, are there any ongoing trials with the combination of the CDK46 uh, inhibitor plus the HIF2 inhibitor uh, that you know about? <clears throat> uh, great questions today. And some of them are making me smile and some of, the, some of them are making me wince. So we, uh, my, my colleague, Tony Chwari, has been working doggedly, tirelessly, to get a CDK4-6 inhibitor trial up and running. Uh, it turns out, much to our surprise, that uh, Tony could not find a single case report of a kidney cancer patient treated with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. So if anyone knows of such, please uh, send it in the chat. But we, we can't find a report of a kidney cancer patient treated with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Uh, so I think the single agent trial will hopefully begin before the end of the year. It's been slowed a little bit because of COVID. Uh, we have run into the usual buzzsaw of combining two drugs from two different companies. And so that has slowed things down further. And so I think the, the, the thought now is let's see if there's any single agent activity, and then we can have the conversation again about, about the combination. And then another question about uh, kind of side effects related to the HIF2 inhibitor. Um, so anemia was considered an on-target toxicity related to it. Um, yeah. And, you know, in terms of from a EPO management, like, you know, how often are you seeing people uh, require uh, that for management? Yeah, uh, that's one where I'm going to have to stay in my lane and defer to my clinical colleagues. I don't know how often you have to give the EPO. Uh, but I'm told it's easily manageable with EPO, so I'm assuming that means it's, it's not prohibitively frequent that you have to give the EPO. Uh, as I said, the, the, the toxicity I'm more concerned about is the hypoxemia. Uh, as this patient, as, as this goes into broader and broader use, uh, I think we're going to have to keep an eye on this. 
Again, thankfully, it's usually asymptomatic, but uh, you can imagine in patients who have underlying lung disease or who, who live at high altitude, I think one of the first cases that they recognized was a patient in Denver. Uh, so I think we're going to have to you know, keep an eye on this. Um, another question from the audience. So, um, you know, certainly when we talk about any of these small molecules, you're really hitting multiple different cellular types and cellular compartments. Um, what do you think the effect of um, you know, these treatments are in terms of the, the microenvironment. Um. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's a good question. I guess it depends on how you define the, the microenvironment. I mean, certainly HIPs controlling a number of secreted factors. VEGF is not the only one. We know, for example, it, it affects TGF-alpha, uh, for example. It affects the PTGF-B chain, et cetera, et cetera. And then we know that HIP is having profound effects on the metabolism of the tumor, and hence is having profound effects on intratumoral uh, pH, uh, oxygen utilization, other metabolites. Uh, and so there's a cottage industry measuring some of these changes. I mean, people also, of course, are looking at immune cells and immune cell infiltration. But as you can probably tell from my talk, I'm a diet in the world cancer geneticist. So I like to let the genetics guide me to what the cancers think are most important. I, you know, I think people are doing a lot of phenotyping of changes in the microenvironment. But I, I think without genetic anchors, you, you quickly can wind up in the, sort of the blind man and the elephant sort of situation where you're measuring lots of stuff, but you don't know what's correlative, what's causative, what should be targeted, what shouldn't be targeted. But I think we have to do it. I mean, it's important foundational information. Yeah. And could you also speak to kind of the relationship between kind of HIF-1 and HIF-2 and, yeah. you know, the, the switch? Yeah, another great question. So when I was a clinician, we used to say there were doctors who were lumpers and doctors who were splitters, and I was always sort of a lumper. So I was always looking for the commonalities between things as opposed to the things that differed between things. And so uh, I, I also tend to be a, a, a lumper when it comes to being a biologist. So I would have liked to have behaved as though HIP-1 was kind of the same as HIP-2, but kicking and screaming here, you have to be a, a, a splitter, that even though they bind to very similar DNA sequences, uh, there are some genes that are uniquely regulated by HIF-2, such as EPO. Uh, there are other genes that are uniquely regulated by HIF-1, such as some of the glycolytic genes. So there are some profound differences. And that's just with respect to their canonical roles of binding to DNA and activating transcription. There's work of Celeste Simon and others suggest they may have some non-canonical roles as well that also differ. So uh, I, I think we're just learning what are the critical differences, but there are many differences between the two. It was shown earlier by, uh, uh, I think, both Marston Linehan and Peter Ratcliffe that if you look at the earliest, earliest recognizable lesions in the kidneys of patients with VHL disease, you can actually see that there's more HIF-1 than HIF-2, but then as they get more dysplastic and more angry looking, it flips. There's more HIF-2 than HIF-1. So that's consistent with HIF-2 being the bad guy and HIF-1 at least in later stages of the tumor being a good guy. There's some debate right now whether during tumor initiation, whether it actually is HIF-1 that's responsible for the initiation. We just don't know. And has any of that been useful for looking at um, a predictor sensitivity to the HIF-2 inhibitor? Yeah, another great question. So, so far, all of the obvious things to look at have not been terribly useful with the possible exception of levels of HIF-2 itself in the tumors. Uh, it's, it's another painful uh, thing for me to remember that the field doesn't really have a great HIF-2-alpha antibody for uh, IHC of clinical samples. Uh, we had made a good one and the hybridoma was lost, a very painful exercise many years ago, and no one's ever been able to quite recreate it. So I think HIF-2-alpha HIF levels might be one uh, we should be able to make a HIF-2 signature because, again, there are enough genes that are uniquely regulated by HIF-2 that maybe we can come up with some HIF-2 signature or maybe using nanostring or something. Uh, certainly, looking at mutations in cooperating genes such as PBRM1, BAP1, et cetera, hasn't been terribly uh, useful, nor has the nature of the VHL mutation. So a, a lot still to learn. And another question that people had was, um, you know, for people who've had long-term responses to things like, you know, high-dose IL-2, like, you know, yeah. are you thinking that there's something very distinct about those diseases yeah. or those patients? Yeah, well, that's, I love these questions because we, we had this debate just the other day on a podcast. So 
You know, there is a view, and I'm open to this view, that if we were smart enough, there would be some patients who right out of the gate would be treated with, for example, anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1, and forget the VEGF inhibitor. Like them, there, there probably is a subset of patients who maybe would be ideal candidates for aggressive immune checkpoint blockade. <clears throat> and so I say two things. First of all, it's increasingly clear that VEGF is not just an angiogenic factor, it's also an immunosuppressive factor. So now I'll go back to being a lumper, thinking maybe we should still have a VEGF inhibitor in the mix. But the other thing I said was, and, and the premise was, well, we're gonna have a predictive biomarker that will tell us which patients will be treated with an anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1. We'll have a biomarker of who's gonna be most likely to respond to immune manipulation. And my response was, that sounds great in principle, but I'm still waiting for the biomarker that tells us who will get cured with high dose IL-2 because people have been talking about that for over a decade and I'm still waiting for it. So uh, it sounds good in principle. I think in practice, it might be pretty hard. Uh, so another question from the audience, like uh, how about HIF-3 alpha? Like how does that um, play into the thinking? Yeah, so HIF-3 is, I'm embarrassed to say, an understudied cousin of HIF-1 and HIF-2. Most of the protein isoforms that have been examined to date for HIF-3 are actually not capable of activating transcription. In fact, they act as so-called dominant negatives that block the action of HIF-1 and HIF-2. So I think we are still learning about HIF-3. Uh, so if someone's interested, uh, go for it, because we don't know enough about HIF-3. HIF Uh, so one last question from the audience. Um, you know, do you see some of these drugs being tested and moved into the adjuvant setting? Yeah, well, that's an ongoing discussion. Uh, I, I, I am pretty bullish that a HIF2 alpha inhibitor would be helpful in the adjuvant setting. And uh, again, thankfully, with, it's relatively well tolerated with the caveats we've already mentioned of anemia and uh, largely asymptomatic hypoxemia. But uh, I'm bullish that at least as a thought experiment, it would work in the adjuvant setting and would also be chemo preventative in VHL patients. But again, that's, that's based on just speculation. Yeah. So Dr. Kalin, thank you so much for taking your time to speak with us and you know being with the Kidney Cancer Association today for IKCS 2020. Um, it was an outstanding talk and you know you truly are a great scientist though. So. Wow, well, that's very kind of you. It was my pleasure. Everyone stay safe, and thank you for the work that you all do. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.